Hey everyone, I uh, just wanted to talk about kind of a video inspired by the, the YouTuber Misha Petrov who I'll link in the description and uh, she kind of done a video on kind of her, her journey leaving the left and kind of her experiences in, a, in woke universities I don't especially like that term but if the shoe fits so I kind of just wanted to talk about kind of my own experience, my own journey in this regard so, for anyone who's maybe followed my YouTube channel for a while, so this YouTube channel has been going for maybe nine years, and uh, maybe around 2014, 15, I would have described myself as, as left-wing, as maybe not extremely left-wing, but I probably adopted some quite extreme ideas. So, for anyone that couldn't tell, I'm Scottish, I currently live in Edinburgh, and I voted yes during the independence referendum and again I feel like it was kind of a kind of a revolutionary stage in my life and I think many people have this ten tendency as well that they, they see some sort of injustice in the world and they just want to tear society down they want to start anew and it was in this moment that I, I voted yes for Scotland to become independent from the United Kingdom. And at this at this point in time, I was quite a militant anti-feist, if you can call it that. So at this point, I'd watched a lot of Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, the New Atheists, and I, I viewed religion is this solely totalitarian structure. Not solely, but that's primarily the lens in which I viewed organised religion today. And it's, I find it quite incredible actually, the kind of, the, the transition in my own thinking on these points. So, I'd say at the, at the height of my kind of left-wing revolutionary kind of mindset, it was probably some point around 2014, 15, maybe even bleeding into 2016. At this point, I'd also loosely adopted a belief in, uh, I think it was John Fresco's Venus Project. So it was a resource-based economy where there was no private ownership. We all just recycled our goods. We, we had no private ownership, so we would give back whatever we used as soon as we'd finished using it. And look, these lovely, fanciful, kind of utopian dreams. But that, that started to unravel. I would say from 2016 onwards. So, at this point in my life, I was in college, preparing to go to university in 2017. And it was the kind of, it's the complete polarisation of all discussion that I feel like was, was probably the catalyst for me moving away from the left. So in college, or I, I, to, to, to back up, it was the, the kind of the Trump derangement syndrome. I don't care for Donald Trump. He does seem like a piece of shit. I don't care about his policies. I think you can argue that he done some things relatively well before the pandemic. America's economy did appear to be kind of reviving itself at that point I think it was in 2019 that it was one of the, 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 the lowest levels of unemployment among ethnic minorities in America's recorded history so he done, he done fair enough, you know he done some things well but I, yeah, I, I don't consider myself a fan of Donald Trump but it's the argument, it's the polarisation around them. So, you have people that I thought were very respectable, like Sam Harris. He went completely off the deep end into Trump derangement syndrome. And Sam Harris is someone that I have a great affinity for. He's an incredibly intelligent, eloquent speaker. But then he, he came out and said to the effect that Donald Trump is, is perhaps... I think he said the greatest purveyor of lies in human history. It's like, okay, you've lost all grounding to reality at this point. And it's something that I just noticed more and more 
as I went through university. So I went to university for my undergraduate in philosophy and psychology in Dundee. And then I went into uh, my master's in philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. And I'd say at Edinburgh especially is a very left-leaning social justice warrior, woke if you want to use that word, institution. And it's the complete flippant disregard that students and lecturers have, I'd say especially in my experiences at Edinburgh Uni, where people just think it's totally acceptable to try and beat the shit out of Donald Trump. Or, so I had one ethics lecturer who just called Donald Trump a dick, a dick pot. A dick pot? A tin pot dictator. That was a weird... What, what is that? Spoonerism? So he, he... So she said that Donald Trump was this tin pot dictator during, I think it was the, the, the Capitol building riots. And it's just like, how is anyone that is even vaguely a supporter of Donald Trump supposed to feel comfortable in an environment like that? And again, I don't consider myself to be a supporter, but I, I, I do have some serious apprehensions when you're creating an environment where people feel compelled to censor themselves and their own political beliefs. And that was rife throughout my experience in kind of Edinburgh University. So I also studied the ethics of artificial intelligence and and, and one kind of oh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the book I think it was called uh, I think it was called Beyond Race and it was a book basically about how current implementations of artificial intelligence today can lead to racist outcomes they can lead to the disproportionate um access of goods depending on one's class, gender. So if you have an algorithm that's, for example, selecting people to be uh, pro processed onto the next stage of like, say, onto like job interviews. And, and these algorithms, for example, if they detect any kind of characteristics associated with being black, so living in primarily black areas or going to black schools primarily, they are less likely to favor those individuals and to hand out interviews to those of non-black kind of typically white backgrounds so yep yeah, that's all that that completely makes sense but it's this idea that it's embedded in what was called coloniality so it's this idea that these are just extensions of colonialism and imperialism from four or five hundred years ago and it's it, that's kind of the problem it's enmeshed in this world view of just oppressors and slaves and that Everything we can look at today is this Hegelian kind of master-slave dialectic that the slaves are just working away for their masters and that, that they create the world, that the world is built off the backs of these slaves or of these oppressed individuals and the masters just reap all of the rewards. Which takes me to, and again this is a, a kind of an idea or a, a stream of thought that was very apparent in my time in, in the Edinburgh University. So people would use phrases like toxic masculinity or the patriarchy. I remember lecturers using those phrases a lot. And this is very commonplace. It's known by I denial had no one challenged those those labels, which suggests something. In fact, that I, I think I was probably one of the few people that really challenged any of these ideas at my time there. And I'd, I ended up in, in one particular instance where it all kind of it knitted together. So I was standing outside um, after a lecture and I was debating kind of three people, three girls that I, I consider to be relatively close to. And uh, we were talking about feminism or some related issues. And we were in this kind of the middle of this heated debate and one of the girls said to me, well, girls are more likely to be attacked. They're more likely to be the victims of violence. And I challenged that and said, no, it's typically young men that are the, the, the sole victims of you know, violence or unwanted violence say, in the streets. And she said, oh, yeah, that's, that's correct. And then it wasn't her admission, I guess, is a good thing. 
it's the fact that the conversation just zipped by onto the next point. And again, this is where it all kind of came into place. It all fell together that these disparate kind of experiences suddenly made sense. It's like, it doesn't matter who's right. People don't care. They, it's, to borrow a phrase from Dave Rubin, who I'm also not a huge fan of, but I like the phrase, he calls it kind of the oppression Olympics. That's what it is. You have a conversation about about feminism or men's issues, and it's one of the reasons I don't refer to myself as a male rights activist or anything like that. It's people are con. It's just it's just top trumps. People want to say I'm more oppressed than you, and others come back and say no, actually me and my group are more oppressed than you. We're really the ones that are suffering, and it's complete bullshit. People just talk by one another. It's two ships in the night. No one gives a shit about the grievances of the other side and they just want to assert that they are suffering and that more often than not they want to argue that they are suffering more than you and your group. And that's kind of where it started to make sense that no, I can't have any part of this. And again, I don't think it's something exclusive to the left. I think, again, the right, the manosphere and groups parallel to that also adopt this victimhood mentality. So there was a good paper actually by William Costello, I forget the name of the paper, and he released it this year and he said there was basically four kind of key factors that, psychological factors that, that kind of constituted kind of then cell ideology. One of them was rumination, moral superiority, the need for recognition, which is one I've talked about a lot um, on a channel and on a research paper I'm working on. And at the fourth, um, was this what was called a tendency for self victimhood or it was the the idea that others would recognize your suffering and you'd be accepted for it and this is just an idea this tendency for interpersonal victimhood is the actual term he used and it's just everywhere and you're not going to pierce through it facts logic they don't pierce through the veil of victimhood and of self-imposed oppression, it doesn't work. And that's one of the reasons why I've, I've left the left, and I don't necessarily consider myself to be a right-wing or a conservative thinker. If anything, I consider myself to be kind of somewhat of a centrist. Uh, there's a, a phrase or a term that the philosopher Raymond Aron, so he was a French philosopher, he was close friends, as far as I'm aware, well, up until a point. He was close friends with Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and I think Simone Veil. And possibly others, maybe Maurice Merleau-Ponty as well. And he came up with this kind of term like conservative liberalism or liberal conservatism. And I think that's kind of loosely where I find myself I'm probably more conservative than most liberals and I'm probably more liberal than most conservatives. But, and another kind of interesting example, so I had went with some friends back to um, a girl's house. So all of us went back in a group of maybe, I don't know, 10 people or something like that. And again, we were talking about kind of feminism. I'm not sure how it came up actually, but we were talking about feminism and I said something to the effect of that I wasn't a feminist. I didn't necessarily believe in the gender pay gap. I thought there was actually other demographic factors that could explain the the the, the gender pay gap, and as she kind of jokingly remarked, I, I, she was going to throw me out of the window. And again, it was just a joke. She she wasn't like a, this evil person, but it doesn't matter. There's such a guttural emotional response to any criticism, and it's because you're denying their identity in some some way, which sounds. Which is even something you'll hear a lot of people say, maybe in regards more so to the trans issue, but it's something that permeates deeper into these kind of social justice issues. And she says she's going to throw me out the window, and it makes sense. It's you, you, you've denied. You're saying you don't recognise their oppression, which isn't true. Obviously, all people of all demographics suffer, which is kind of the point I'm trying to make. But it creates this just complete haze of irrationality and this idea that you're denying their suffering. So we continued on 
and that's completely pointless to me. And uh, I said something to the effect of that I, I, I don't support any movements or ideologies that create this kind of Hegelian master-slave dialect between oppressors and the oppressed. Same reason I don't believe in Marxism, same reason I don't believe really in any form of feminism or male rights activism. And another person kind of piped up and said, oh, so you don't believe in Black Lives Matter then? And then the whole room fell silent, which which spoke more loudly than perhaps any other experience in my life. There is just no room for dissent. And there's an interesting study I read, like in uh, that I think it was either forty or sixty percent of students on university campuses felt the need to self censor, and that is very true for my own experiences. And even in that instance where they said, so you don't support BLM. And I said, there's a, there's a lot of evaluation. There's like, you know, nine, ten people turn around looking at you, waiting with bated breath in your response. And I just said, yeah, of course, people of all races suffer. And I think, I don't deny it, I think black people have historically, especially in the last few hundred years, have suffered to a far greater extent than white people. But I also don't believe that there's this inherent sense of white privilege that is at the, the core of every white person and of every human heart. I don't believe that there's this cabal of people in society today working to oppress ethnic minorities or working to just simply better the lives of white individuals. And again, you can find numerous statistics where not only do black people or ethnic minorities suffer in a particular regard, but you can find numerous statistics where white people suffer in some specific domain. So working class white males are the least likely demographic to go to universities in the UK. And it's probably in some regards for a good reason because in my masters I was the only white Scottish male in a Scottish institution. And I was the only the only one. So it shows you that there's universities are the refuge for largely wealthy liberal students, not from, not they're not the refuge of blue, uh, of kind of blue collar, working class individuals, these are for the social elites, these are for people that can afford thousands of pounds in rent every month, for thousands of dollars on rent in America, usually, usually dispensed to them from their parents, and it's just a completely hostile atmosphere. For anyone of a kind of remotely working class, conservative, right wing kind of background. And I think it's deeply troubling. I don't know what the solution is, but yeah, that was kind of my journey to kind of where I am today, where I tried to argue for more kind of centrist values and kind of Confucian values. And for anyone that's read or watched any of my videos, kind of how do you kind of cultivate this sense of like positive regard for everyone? of benevolence, of what Jonathan Haidt said, kind of an identity politics based on the fact that we share a human sense of humanity. That's a kind of interesting philosophical goal for me and for this channel. But I'll, I'll leave it there. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like. And if you want more of this content, please subscribe. And if there's any way you can contribute to this channel, to I have a, a Patreon. So if you can offer any money, any con contributions, I would greatly appreciate that. So... There, again, the Patreon should be up by now, by the time you watch this video. So really, your support allows me to to make more content like this, to explore issues in more depth, and it gives me the, the kind of the time and the freedom to really consider these ideas. So if you like this, please, any and all support is greatly appreciated. So I just want to say thank you again just for your kindness, generosity, and support, and take care.